Charles Circum. Andrew Blenkiron, he's got the microphone up there on the... It's quite hard to see you, there's no lights up there, so I'll just hear a voice, Andrew. OK, yep. Uh, Mrs Spellman, uh, I bet after the recent uh, couple of days you've had, you wish it would rain equally as much as we all would. Yes. Uh, my question is about, uh, obviously, about water. Uh, given that we all face the challenge of, uh, of food security in this country, how do you expect us, the farmers, to assist in delivering this? Especially when agriculture is a poor relation when it comes to access to water. Uh, whilst we all agree that uh, there should be a fair balance between satisfying the needs of the environment, public water supply and farming, what are you going to do to ensure that national agricultural water security and that what farming gets its fair share? Mm. After all, uh, we collect the water for everybody. Yes, we, yes you, you do. And Andrew, I just want to give you um, a you know, very clear assurance. You're not the poor relation, not at all. I'd like to make it really clear to you that at the drought summit um, yesterday, there were several representatives of the farming industry at the table. And it was a third of these summits. And Peter came to one of the first ones. And you know, he very bravely said, you know, we understand as farmers that we have to, we have to cope with the weather. That's part of the job. And I think you know, he got the position of the industry absolutely right the first time we met in a gathering of all the stakeholders who, who need the water. But I think what came out of that really um, uh, constructive approach um, from Peter at a previous um, uh, water summit, drought summit, was a new willingness on the part of um, the water companies and the environment agency to do everything that they can to help you. And in practical terms, what that meant last May when we had the drought summit was we found new ways of helping the abstraction regime be more flexible and more transparent, um, helping farmers trust that if they shared unused abstraction licenses to help out some of their neighbors, they wouldn't subsequently be penalized, and to create a new spirit of trust and cooperation. Now, that is actually going to inform the reform of the abstraction regime which needs to happen, which we've committed ourselves to in our water white paper. But specifically, with the second dry winter in a row, yesterday we were discussing what more we can do to help you. And again, the water companies and the environment agency will bend over backwards to help you with things like winter filling of your reservoirs, if, if, if that is at all possible still to do. I have to say the medium forecast is, is not for very much rainfall uh, before we get into the, the heavy growing season, which is why I you know, honestly said to you that I think it is going to be difficult for agriculture again. But please don't go away with the impression that you, you are in any way the poor relation as part of this. You are not, because the nation depends on your ability to grow the food, and for that you need the water. And again, in very practical terms for the longer term, uh, we're looking to make it um, more attractive to you to invest on more on-farm storage capacity. You know, that is one practical way in which you can be helped to help others. Um, it's clearly something that we need to do. Who knows? A second dry winter on the trot, this could be the new norm. Yesterday in the drought summit, we had to think in terms of what if this is what climate change means and this is the new normal. We need new strategies for coping for these kind of extreme weather events because they may become more the norm. So I think a number of practical ideas uh, came forward yesterday. It, it, some people sometimes say, why don't we simply you know, pipe the water from the northwest that has it in abundance to the southeast that has, doesn't have so much of it? You will know um, that transporting water over long distances doesn't make economic sense. What does make sense is better local connectivity. So the water companies are approaching this in a very cooperative spirit, sharing resources with each other to help the water go round, um, to help drought-stressed parts of the country, and creating better connections between their own boreholes, rivers, and reservoirs, and doing all that they can to help us catch the water when it comes. But in this process, your suggestions for how we can become more resilient in the face of these extreme weather events will also be very much appreciated. That's an open invitation to you to help contribute to the new adaptation plan. So, certainly for farmers in East Anglia, Secretary of State, you know, they're immensely worried. They've got a lot of yes. investment yes. tied up, you know, a lot of gearing 
to be producing those vegetables, and if they're now having to make the decision they can't plant them, their businesses are very vulnerable exposed on that. I perfectly so understood that. And again, the, the drought summit has the advantage of having everybody around the table, everybody who needs the water and the things that we grow with the water. And the Food and Drink Federation were there, the British Retail Consortium were there, and your own farm representatives were there, saying very clearly that the, the impact this will have will be reduced plantings. Uh, because, you know, decisions are having to be made now. But, you know, the most important thing is to be transparent with the information, to encourage a spirit of trust and cooperation, to share the resources around where we can, and to give you the best possible help and advice we can as you make those very, very difficult business decisions. I don't underestimate that. Thank you. Stuart Yarwood and Charles Serkin, please. Uh, Secretary of State, thank you very much for your reassuring address this morning. Um, my issue is nitrate vulnerable zones consultation. And the question, uh, most livestock farmers in the northwest are confused and dismayed by this current consultation, but for different reasons. We feel the consultation is divisive, premature, as the present MVZ regulations have only been mandatory for a few weeks. So please, can you offer advice to, firstly, why a farmer not in an NVZ area wish to be placed in one by adopting the whole country approach? Secondly, why would a farmer in an NVZ area wish the existing regulations to become more restrictive? Thirdly, why would a farmer with, with an NVZ derogation not wish that f facility to continue? And finally, and most importantly, why should a farmer with a storage structure built before 91, 1991 become outlawed by its age rather than by the quality it was constructed by? I know the strength of feeling on this, and we've heard it um, uh, loud and clear. And um, what I will say to you is we're listening to this, we're consulting on this. I'll take on board all three points that you've made to me, Stuart. And certainly I know that um, uh, Jim has this very much um, on his agenda. He's speaking tomorrow, could perhaps go into a bit more detail on this, but we both heard your message very, very clearly and the practical problems that this is causing. And as I said, you know, we're trying to change our, our culture as a department so that we see you as customers to serve uh, and work through with you how we can get this to work better uh, for you that need to work with these new regulations. So uh, believe, believe me, um, that's been heard loud and clear. Thank you for that commitment, Secretary of State. Charles Serkin, please. Secretary of State, respect, partnership, and a desire to listen were three overarching themes of your speech this morning. Therefore, following the formation of the Animal Health and Welfare Board, will you please reassure us that it will not be used as a vehicle to fill the 50 million pound void looming in your budget? leaving the livestock industry to pick up the bill for your inefficient department. Well, a, cu a, couple, of, a couple of things on that. Th that's a little bit um, cynical, Charles. Uh, you know, um, <laughs> it, it, Fortunately, it, I'm a cynical it, by nature. Yeah, OK, <laughs> all right. Um, but remember, this is, this, is, this is absolutely in the direction of travel um, that uh, this government is trying to take actually a number of industries in. It's about um, a partnership working relationship with the government of the day, uh, being more involved in the political decision making. That's what you have always said that you wanted. And it's right that you should be more involved with the, in the political decision making because you're much closer to the front line, all of that that I said at the beginning. So actually having the livestock industry and its representatives more closely involved in, in the policy making is, is now given tangible expression by this new board. You know, but with that sort of process of uh, being involved in the policy making comes some responsibilities. So I think that you will find that your own representatives on that board do a very good job for you in terms of better informing the policy decisions that come out of that. And you know, just in terms of the department and its efficiency, and I spent especially with the permanent secretary and the DG sitting right here under my nose, I should just say that, you know, DEFRA is a department that 
Um, I came into new from opposition. I had not shadowed this brief. And I think it's right to pay tribute to the fact that when we walked into that department, those civil servants were immensely cooperative in helping to deliver the savings that we need to make to sort out this nation's finances. And they did that in a really constructive spirit. And I think we have managed um, to come up with a plan that does make the department more efficient, uh, more focused, um, more responsive, I hope, to the, to the, to the pressures that, that are faced in the marketplace and the unexpected, unexpected um, events that turn up, the, the drought being a, a good example. And I think it is demonstrably a more efficient department, but we aren't looking to, to backfill the shortfall in the way that, that, that I think you describe, but actually to move forward in partnership working with the industry, the livestock industry, which, as somebody previously said, I fully understand is under pressure, and I've seen the impact on last year's incomes. But your seat at the table as an industry on that board is going to make a difference. Of that, I can give you an assurance. Thank you, Secretary of State. We've um, had a, a wide and varied morning, but I think the, the last question, um, you know, is, is a concern for the industry. We remember the whole debate with Rosemary Radcliffe, the work she did, the National Audit Office basically saying that the numbers didn't add up, the cost centres weren't properly accounted for within DEFRA. That leaves the livestock industry incredibly worried about when large cuts need to be made, that it's going in the right place and services are being delivered as cost effectively as possible to the industry. So, you know, I just tell you that the, the audience here, the livestock industry is watching yeah. very closely to see how that progress is made. But I can give you the assurance that the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Danny Alexander, actually commends DEFRA for the rigour that has been brought into its financial accounting and the transparency that it has now on a month-by-month -month basis, sharing with the Treasury how we keep our costs under control. You can understand that, you know, as the whole of the government is, strives to um, pay back the nation's deficit and reduce its deficit and put the nation's economy on a sound footing, the Treasury is looking, you know, very minutely at how each department spares these precious, spends these precious resources, but actually DEFRA, perhaps born of its past experience, has been really innovative in this area and has won that commendation from the Treasury that hopefully will give your industry um, the assurance that you can have confidence in us as a department to uh, husband our resources uh, with, with great care and yours too. Look, um, Secretary of State, we, we're in a very, an industry that is having you know, genuine growth, a more optimistic outlook. Yes. We're not going to ignore the fact that the government's got to make really difficult decisions and we want to play a part in that. What I would like to see on that um, um, a clean bill of health from the National Audit Office actually to say now it does, it is really clear and then I think the farmers will understand what's going on. I think it's been a you know, fascinating morning seeing the Commissioner, seeing the, mm. the points and the yeah. arguments you've made around CAP. It's very, very apparent to me that we've got a long way to go on CAP reform. Um, you know, I do want to hold you to your commitment to bat for English farmers and Welsh farmers, Scottish farmers, Northern Irish farmers to make sure we get a fair deal. But it is that slide, it is trying to make sure that we don't have more complexity on greening, that we do have a CAP that leaves us being confident about our agri-environment schemes as well going forward. Um, the questions of double funding are addressed. Richard Betton's comments about the uplands, etc., as well, are all addressed. This is going to be a very busy period, um, I know, coming up. And we want to work closely with you, as I said earlier on, and I think we need to make sure we form a very strong partnership with the Commission as well to get yeah. the right outcome. So thank you very much indeed, Secretary of State, for your contribution this morning. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Yes. I've got, a, I've got a little bit of housekeeping. First of all, I would like you to stay in your seats just for a couple of minutes, if you could, please, because for security reasons, we need some clearance around the back. So please stay in your seats just for a couple of minutes. We are going to have lunch served in Hall 3, and um, Mark Beresford-Smith is going to come and scare the living daylights out of us at 1.30 on the state of the European and global economy. So please be back in your seats for 1.30. Please stay seated, if you can, for the next couple of minutes while we just make some clearance around the back. Thank you very much indeed.